guy who's trying to smash the keyboard over his knee? Have you ever felt like that? I know I have. I can't see that without chuckling because I have felt like that plenty of times. Your computer gets frozen, it gets stuck, and there's only one thing to do, right? Reboot. If it's Windows, it's Control-Alt-Delete, and it's always at the worst possible time. But here's the question. Do you ever get stuck besides your computer? Relationships, habits, addictions, patterns, uh, there are all kinds of places. Whether it's something we create or someone, someone else's creates, we get stuck all the time. So what happens when you need a reboot in real life? Well, the way the Bible describes it is repentance. You know, we're moving along, we're going down a path, and we've always got that battle with that old sinful nature. So we're struggling along, and it seems like we're doing the right thing, seems like we're doing the thing we're supposed to be, and we're going along, and then all of a sudden, something gets our attention, and we realize that the voice of God isn't cheering us on, it's calling us back. Turning us back from, from whatever it is we've been pursuing, back to God and back to the things that are healthy and good. That's what a reboot, that's what a restart looks like. And all of us need it from time to time in different places. That, by the way, is what the whole season of Lent is about. This whole season is about thinking honestly and clearly and candidly about our brokenness and our sin and our habits and our patterns and coming to grips with the fact that none of us measure up on the righteousness scale, that all of us need a reboot. So we've been talking about a number of different topics and we've been trying to dig in and look at them, all of that from the perspective of the cross because you see, if we needed a reboot and, and we had this thing called repentance but we didn't know what happens after that, it would be terrifying. But dear friends, when it comes to our faith, the reboot the turning back is always into the arms of a Father who loves us, always into the arms of a Savior who died for us. So today, the topic that we're talking about, the place where we need to think about a reboot, has to do with parenting. Now I know some of you may say, well wait a minute, that's no fair, I'm not a parent. Well the good news is that every single one of our relationships can be seen through the filter of this message. Everything that we talk about today can apply to the other relationships, but I want to talk about it in a very specific way because lots of us, lots of us are parents, some with little bitty ones, some expecting, some of them with kids like us, kids who are empty nests, maybe you've even got grandkids. You know, when you think about this whole idea of parenting, it can be a lot of fun. You know, I think about some of the words that my kids used to say that were so special. Anybody have special words that they remember? So my, my baby girl, who's not really a baby anymore, she's a sophomore in college, but I still think of her like this. She was actually a little bit younger than this, and, and so we went to the doctor's office. It was for a checkup, and I went with Julie, and we were in the doctor's office. And you know how sometimes the pediatrician will talk directly to the child to sort of test things out and check their cognitive development and see what's going on? And I remember the doctor looked at Katie, and he said, what's your favorite food? And Katie said, cauliflower and dimp. Now you can imagine the doctor immediately looked up and looked at her and then looked at us like, really? It was the first time in his entire practice that anyone had ever told him cauliflower was their favorite food. But that word dimp, you know, that, that was the cute word because she was talking about dip. She, was, she loved to have ranch dressing. In fact, just when she was home over Christmas break, there were a number of times where she was sitting there with a plate full of cauliflower, dipping it in ranch dressing. She loves it to this day. Jeffrey, Jeff is in this picture all the way on the outside. It's actually Michael's birthday, but Jeff is there on, on my knee. And uh, Jeffrey, I've shared with you our favorite word from his growing up days, cha-cha. It's not my, only my favorite word from Jeff's vocabulary, it's one of my favorite things. <laughs> Chocolate. Cha-cha. By the way, even though I used the illustration at the end of the message last week and I talk about the Snickers bar, the person, and you know who you are, who left the mammoth Snickers bar in my office this week, <laughs> I'm watching for you. <laughs> Michael, who's there in the middle, Michael was always enthusiastic, 
And so let's say we, we said, hey, Mike, you want to go get an ice cream cone? And his response would be, yes, a big, huge one. Because he wanted a huge ice cream cone. And then, of course, Nick, I, I'm not sure what Julie's favorite, uh, favorite word was. He, he had a couple. You know, remember when Little Mermaid came out and Nick was a boy? And uh, he, was, he was nervous and afraid around sharps. That's what he thought they were cutting, you know, because they had sharp teeth. He was worried about sharks. Or from, uh, from one of the other Disney movies, you know, he had the word floffer whenever he talked about a flower. I mean, those are fun memories, aren't they? But the thing is, parenting is not all fun either. It's hard work. Wouldn't it have been nice? I mean, just daydreaming for a minute together, wouldn't it have been nice if Paul would have been inspired by the Holy Spirit to write a third letter to the Corinthians and it had been a manual on divine, divine manual on parenting? That would have been really good. Because when our, when our kids are struggling, when they're, when they're hurting or when they're sick or when they're injured or when they're confused or when they're moving in the wrong direction or when they're facing some kind of an obstacle, and it doesn't matter if they're little bitty or if they're all grown up with kids of their own, when our kids hurt, it has an impact. It hurts us. This parenting stuff is tough. And sometimes we get stuck. Today we want to talk about parenting in the light of Lent, in the light of the cross. We want to talk about parenting when we need a reboot. And we're going to do it from a negative example. I want you to brace yourself because the story that we're going to talk about today from David and Absalom is a brutal story. But there's a lot to learn. So let's, let's go back just a little bit. You know that David had a number of different wives and he blended a number of different families and so two of his children, Absalom and Tamar, brother and sister, Absalom and Tamar loved each other dearly. He also had a son, a stepbrother to Absalom and Tamar, whose name was Amnon. Now the scripture tells us that Tamar was a beautiful girl, and she caught Amnon's eye. And Amnon did something terrible. He committed an egregious sin, offense, against Tamar. And, and so Absalom and Tamar let, let their father, the King David, know what had happened. And he did nothing. Well, you know, this wound was not only against Tamar. Her brother was so deeply wounded and angry and that anger settled into his heart as bitterness. And the fact that his father would not give justice, that he wouldn't do anything with Amnon, and he didn't do anything to help Tamar, and it's just, it just brewed and bubbled and, and worked inside of him until it became this terrible, terrible rage. In fact, so deep and so dark that Absalom conspired and created a trap and lured his brother Amnon into this trap and killed him and his men. I don't know if you've any, ever done anything that was really bad or maybe something that you thought was really bad. I think I've told you the story about the time when I was, uh, I don't know, kindergarten to second grade. And I was able to walk home after school. And so one day I was walking home after school and I saw that there were a whole bunch of kids. They were throwing rocks at this big pile of dirt on our playground. They were doing some kind of construction. And I watched them throw for a while and I sort of thought, you know what, I can show them how to do this. They were throwing at some target or pail or something that was up on the side of this big mound of dirt. Well, at this particular point in my life, I knew nothing about field of fire. So I reared up and I launched that rock as hard as I could and I thought, wow, that's a good throw. It was a strong throw. It also happened to be a very off-target throw. And what suddenly came into, came into clear focus after I launched this rock was that the, the school building was right behind and the office windows for the principal were right behind that. Psh! Rock shattered the window landed, as my parents told me, on the secretary to the principal's desk. Well, being the, the upstanding, honorable, wanting to do the right thing young man that I was, you know what I did. I took off running. 
I sprinted as hard and fast as I could home. Of course, the telephone lines beat me, and I was already in trouble when I got home. But you know, the thing is, that's exactly what Absalom does. Absalom takes off, but he doesn't run home. He runs away. And for years, for years, he never, ever even sees his father again. Do you know what David does? Absolutely nothing. But there's this really tragic verse. 2 Samuel 13, verse 37. And the spirit of the king longed to go to Absalom, for he was consoled concerning Amnon's death. In other words, David came to grips with the fact that this was revenge, that it was, a, that it was a crime of passion. He came to grips with the fact probably that he was at least in part guilty because he didn't do anything to bring reconciliation. He didn't do anything to bring justice. And so he was consoled about the fact that Absalom had taken Amnon's life, but he says that he longed, he longed to see his son Absalom, and he did nothing about that either. Have you ever been in one of those situations where something is between you and another person and nobody will make the first move? There's some problem and it could probably be solved. But nobody, nobody is willing to take that first step toward reconciliation. That's what's going on here. Because you see, even though Absalom took revenge on his brother, there's no peace in him. Revenge doesn't bring peace or consolation. And so Absalom has this this rage still inside of him, this resentment toward his father. And David isn't willing to take the first step to go and resolve with his son. And so they continue to be apart. In fact, it says three sons and a daughter were born to Absalom. The daughter's name was Tamar, and she became a beautiful woman. Absalom lived two years in Jerusalem. Two years in Jerusalem without even seeing his father's face. David has grandkids, and he doesn't even know them because their father is is estranged from him. Well, like most things, we can pretend like time is going to heal it, right? Right? You know how that works, right? We, we have something and there's a problem, there's a situation, and so we pretend, we compartmentalize it, and we tuck it away as if somehow letting some time pass is going to solve the problem. It never solves those kinds of problems. It just deepens them. And after a while, Absalom's rage, his rebellion, his anger toward his father becomes so deep, it runs so hot that he decides he knows how to overthrow his father's kingdom. He knows how he can put himself in charge. And so he concocts a, a, an incredibly clever plan. Absalom would get up early and stand by the side of the road leading to the city gate. Whenever anyone came with a complaint to be placed before the king for a decision, Absalom would call out to him, What town are you from? He would answer, Your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. And then Absalom would say to him, Look, your claims are valid and proper, but there is no representative of the king to hear you. And Absalom would add, If only I were appointed judge in the land, then everyone who has a complaint or case could come to me and I would see that he gets justice. Absalom behaved this way toward all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice, and so he stole the hearts of the men of Israel. So get this picture. Everyone who has some kind of injustice or wrong, everyone who has a dispute, there in the whole land of Israel, their option is to go to the king, to go through this city gate, to go into the court of the king, and to have a hearing. And it was the king or one of his representatives' responsibility to deliver justice in that claim. Absalom meets every single one of them as they're on their way to to get justice, and he says to them, sorry guys. Not only will you not get justice, you won't even get a hearing. Nobody is there. Boy, if I were the king, if I were judge, if I were in charge, 
I would make sure that you got the justice you deserve. I would make sure that you get the treatment you deserve. But what can I do about it? Can you see how powerful that is? I mean, these are people who are, who are leaving their homes. They're probably walking mile upon mile, sometimes maybe tens of miles. And they're, they're coming from all over, and that means they not only have to leave their home and leave their family, they have to leave their crops, they have to leave their herds, they have to leave their flocks. They have to set aside their livelihood, put everything at risk to go to the king because they desperately need this justice. And they get there, and Absalom says, sorry, nobody can help you. Boy, I wish I, wish I could do it. And it says by this, by this subterfuge, he wins the hearts of the men of Israel. They begin to say back to him, boy, we wish you were king. After a while, people begin to say, you know what, you should be king. After a while, they say, you know what, let's overthrow the king. You know what Absalom is doing has a name. It's called passive aggressive. How many of you know what passive aggressive is? You know, even if you don't know the name, you know what it is because you or someone in your life behaves this way. When you act passive aggressively, it's because you don't want to deal with something straight on. You don't want to deal with the the, the issue of conflict, and we all have a tendency to shy away from that. And so when someone is passive aggressive, it means they have a grievance, they have a problem, they have an issue, but they're not going to solve it with that person face to face. They're going to undermine them. They're going to to be resistant. They're going to be sort of hesitant. They're going to figure out some way to create problems for their plan with the hope of bringing them down. That's exactly what Absalom is doing. Absalom is undermining his father's authority, undermining his kingdom, because he doesn't want to solve the problem between he and his father. It's devastating what happens. But I want you to hear something clearly. Clearly. Passive-aggressive behavior is always devastating. It never solves the problem. It always shifts it to something else and creates more problems in its wake, and it always devastates relationships. In fact, I want to I give you three ways that you can check whether or not you are being passive-aggressive. And by virtue of checking three ways that you can avoid that kind of behavior, number one, examine your goals. If you are are trying to solve a problem, if you are trying to deal with something directly, if you're trying to figure out how to make things better for everyone involved, you are not being passive aggressive. But if you are angry about something else and you're talking to all of the other people and you're trying to bring something down, you're trying to hurt someone for something they've done that has nothing to do with the issue, you are being passive aggressive. If you just don't like them, so you're trying to cause problems in their life, you are being passive aggressive and it is a miserable way to live. It's got to change. Number two, don't talk about someone else. Talk to them. If you've got something that you're upset about and you are talking to all kinds of other people while the person you are upset with is over here, then you are being passive aggressive. Stop talking to them and talk to that person. Number three, Practice gratitude and forgiveness. Now you may say, well, what in the world does that have to do with it? Well, passive-aggressive behavior always comes out of resentment, frustration, bitterness. Well, how do we counteract frustration and resentment and bitterness? With gratitude. When you and I practice gratitude, there's a reason why the scripture over and over tells us to practice gratitude. Because when you and I are practicing gratitude, it drives bitterness and resentment out. There's no room for it. In the same way, when we are filled with bitterness, the way the devil wants it to work in our lives, there's no room for gratitude. So we practice gratitude in order to drive out that bitterness so that that passive-aggressive behavior can never get a foothold because we never begin to think about life that way. And the thing that can guarantee it, sort of the the covering over, that bonus that protects us completely from that kind of bitterness and passive-aggressive activity is when we take gratitude, thankfulness, and we add to it forgiveness. 
You and I are called to forgive. We pray in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we, go ahead, finish it, as we forgive those who sin against us to whom we are indebted. That you and I are called to forgive the way we, to, to call to, for forgiveness the way we forgive. Sometimes people don't know what they've done to us. Sometimes they know but they don't realize and sometimes they've done it on purpose. Do you understand the scripture calls us to forgive everyone their debts that we hold against them? No matter whether they say sorry or not. Well, we've got to get back to the story. Because what happens next is it makes perfect sense but it's terrible. So Absalom is is undermining David's kingdom and David catches wind of this. But again, instead of going to his son, instead of having a sit down, instead of forming some kind of a council to solve the problem, David sends an army. Now if you send an army to solve a problem, you know what's going to happen, don't you? There's gonna be bloodshed. It says, David mustered the men who were with him and appointed over them commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. The king commanded Joab, Abishai, and Ittai, be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. So go to war, guys. Go solve this problem. Put down this uprising, but take really good care. Be really gentle with my son. And all the troops heard the king giving orders concerning Absalom to each of the commanders. Now Absalom happened to meet David's men. He was riding his mule, and as the mule went under a thick, branch, thick branches of a large oak, Absalom's head got caught in the tree. He was left hanging in midair while the mule he was riding kept going. So Joab took three javelins in his hand and plunged them into Absalom's heart while Absalom was still alive in the oak tree. I warned you, this is a bad story. It is a tragic story of parenting gone way wrong. But look what happens next. David hears that Absalom has been killed. And he responds, the king was shaken. He went up to the upper room over the gateway and wept. As he went, he said, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. You can feel the grief in that, can't you? You can feel the pain and the regret and the agony. Dear friends, I want to I take three things from this story that you and I can use in our parenting, we can use in our relationships. These are not a magic formula that means your parenting will have no problems, but they're three things that are essential if we're going to be good parents, if we're going to do it well. Number one, good parenting involves time. We have got to take time. If David and Absalom had simply given one another the gift of time, this probably would not have moved down this tragic path, but they didn't. How many times do we we find ourselves being caught up in all the other stuff that life has to offer, all of the other responsibilities that weigh on our shoulders, and we neglect the people most important to us? You know, my dad was was a great dad, and he gave me all kinds of wisdom. And one of the things that he told me all the way back when Julie and I were first married, when we were expecting Nick, is that one of the things that I needed to be conscious of was that, that he was going to need my time. In fact, he made a suggestion to me that no matter how busy I was, I needed to figure out how to be at the games and the events and the the presentations and the musicals and all of the things that he was going to be involved in. In fact, he suggested that even if I had to skip having a day off, I needed to be at the things where my family needed me to be. That had to be my priority. In fact, for years, I had all kinds of people, pastors who would say to me, that's a big mistake. You need to have a day off, and and that day off needs to be guarded. In fact, if someone even asks you to pray on your day off, you should say no, because you guard your day off. What nonsense. You know, recently I've heard some people teaching pastors about all of this stuff, and they're saying to them, you need to be where your family is. 
Even if you don't get a day off, you need to be at their games and their practices and you need to be at their concerts and at their plays. Well, the reality is that that wisdom that my dad offered me was way ahead of its time. But you see, my dad knew something special. That when it comes to our kids, love is spelled T-I-M-E. We have got to give them time. Number two, good parenting involves humility. Why in the world would we ever pretend like we know everything or we do everything right when everybody in the world, including us, knows that's, that's foolishness? Imagine if, if David had been humble enough when he longed to to be with his son and to see him and to know his family, what if David had been humble enough, instead of sitting proudly in in his throne, what if he had been humble enough to go to his son and say, Absalom, I love you and I miss you, let's reconcile. All of this could have been avoided. But you've got Absalom who is talented and beautiful and gifted and you've got David who is talented and beautiful and gifted and you put those two things together and what comes out naturally is arrogance and pride. What needed to come out of that was humility. Dear friends, why is it that that when it comes to the people we love the most, it's hardest to say I'm sorry to them? Why is it when it comes to the people that we love the most, is it more difficult to say, I was wrong, forgive me, than anywhere else in the world? If we're going to parent well, we have got to be humble enough to let our children understand that when we get it wrong, it was wrong. And we apologize and we move on. When we do that, we pass on to them the lesson that is probably most important in all the world, that they too can be people who live in strength and humility. Number one is time. Number two is humility. Number three is regret. Every parent has regrets. Because the thing is, we're, we're broken. We're sinful and we do our very best, but there are things that we do, there are mistakes that we made. There's not one person I know who doesn't look back and say, I wish I could have done this a little bit differently. What do we do? Well, here's the thing. If if your kids, if they're still available to you, then go to them and talk to them. If your kids are still around, if they're still willing to talk to you, then go to them and say, you know what, I I regret that I made this mistake. I regret that I did this thing. And, And go to them and share that with them and make that first step toward reconciliation. Maybe it won't work, but at least, at least you are giving it the chance to follow the pattern of our God. If your kids aren't available, maybe things have gotten so bad that they won't talk to you anymore, or maybe they're just gone. What do you do with those regrets? Well, dear friends, if you can't talk to your kids, you can't talk to your God. And when all is said and done, it's not your kids who are going to cover over and resolve that regret. It's your kids you reconcile with, the one who covers over and erases those regrets, binds up our broken hearts, is our God through the cross. You know, what's most striking about the grief that David expresses And he says, my son, my son, oh Absalom, my son, my son, if only I could have died instead of you. I mean, he wishes that he could take his place, doesn't he? And I believe that that his words are absolutely sincere. He He would rather be dead than have lost his son. But the thing about that is, if David could have died in place of Absalom, What would that have solved? Nothing. See, David or any one of us dying for our son or for our daughter or in the place of any other human being, it doesn't work. There's only one who can die in the place of someone else and it brings healing and hope and forgiveness and strength and his name is Jesus. 
This whole Lenten season, this whole journey thinking about a reboot, a restart, a fresh start for our lives, the hope and the power of this fresh start is found in the cross where Jesus went there freely, stretched out his arms and carried our sins and there he died for you and me. And by his death and by his blood, you and I have the hope, the opportunity for a fresh start. You know, as I think about parenting, I already mentioned my dad. I was blessed to have great parents. Wonderful mom and a wonderful dad. And I used to treasure the times when I would go home on on break over college and during the seminary, I would love to hang out with my dad. We had this little family business that just barely kept things afloat, but we would would drive around from place to place and I would be with my dad. In fact, can you imagine, we we were stuffed into this Chevy Vega. Anybody remember Chevy Vega? Anybody trying to repress the memory of Chevy Vegas? But we would drive around and we would talk and my dad would ask me questions and and I'd ask him questions. He'd talk to me about life. He'd talk to me about philosophies. He'd talk to me about all kinds of things. And in the course of those conversations, he poured his life into me, but he also shared with me openly and humbly about his regrets. He would talk to me about things that he wished that he had done differently and how he made the mistake and how he would do it differently today. Dear friends, I am blessed to this day by his openness and his willingness to pour his life out truthfully and honestly into me. Do you realize that's what our kids need from us? And when we stumble and fall, the good news is that that we're not the sum total of the parenting they receive. Because what they need most is their heavenly father. Dear friends, you and I have the privilege as we parent of introducing our children, not just to our lives, but of introducing them to their God. Demonstrating that that even though we are weak, he is strong. Even though we make mistakes, he is perfect. And even though we don't solve and don't know the answers to all the questions, he can solve anything including binding up our wounds and forgiving our sins. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for your love and mercy. We thank you that you have sent your son Jesus, and we pray, Lord, that that you would pour into our families through us, into our relationships through us, the humility of your son Jesus Christ and the strength of that same Jesus that we might know the hope that is ours in him. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Now, dear friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And as you leave this place, go into the world and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the message of life.